If you are thinking of getting a lathe, what do you actually look for? My mate Anton was looking for a lathe for the machine shop which he's setting up. Now Anton's machine tastes are a bit more towards the large, rounded, casting, classic machines from the 1950s and 1960s. But I encouraged him to take a look at more modern machines. And he got a really nice deal on this Boxford lathe. For me, a camlock spindle nose, large spindle through hole, and a wide speed range are great features to look for in a lathe. That's a pretty thoughtful design by Boxford. They've got a lifting point right directly in the middle of the bed on one of the big bed ribs, right on the center of gravity. Put an eyelet in and hoist away. Well thought out. You can find those features in some of the earlier lathes, but they became pretty much standard by the 1980s. A convenience item that's nice to have is a threading gearbox with a nice wide range of speeds and threads. Take this off before one of us runs the carriage into it. So this is what, 1982? Yeah, I reckon. Boxford Industrial 1030 lathe. So that's a 10 inch swing with a 30 inch bed, which is kind of the extended length bed version. According to the decal, it's got a six millimeter lead screw, making it a metric lathe, which also agrees with this information here. Right, let's wire up a plug and see what happens. Power on. All right. Cool, it works. Damn, that's a nice lathe, eh? It's a shame I don't live close by. We could switch share chucks. That's identical chuck as the Shoblin. It'd be a different taper on the inside. Okay, it looks like the oil level is a bit low. Oh, let's fill her up. Probably not going to take much, is it? Well, I hope it doesn't take much, because that means it's not really that low. It's very clear oil, it's hard to see, huh? Anything? No. Let's see, so a little bit more than that will probably be it. Let's put a clock on that spindle and see how round it's running, huh? Only a tiny bit of surface rust on the spindle, so that's good. That'll come off in a sec. Yeah, that's looking normal. Two one hundredths of vertical movement when you put a load on it, which may be a bit excessive. Right, so let's throw on the three jaw. Let's throw some bar stock in. Here you see the advantage of a decent sized spindle bore. Basically, no measurable deviation on that clock. Looking good, eh? Yeah. Nice, nice. Also, there was no chatter or anything. I mean, it was a very light cut. Let's try, try a bit of a meteor cut, huh? You can't really argue with that, can you? The next check we're going to do is just see how loose the saddle is, which gives us a bit of an indication of like the total wear between the bed and the saddle sliding surfaces. So if we push and pull on the saddle here, one and a half hundredths of play there. Now we'll do the same reading at the end of the bed where it shouldn't be worn. Out here we've got maybe half a hundredth of a millimeter. That's sort of a, a rough indication of the bed wear. All right, let's just have a look at bed wear using a micrometer. So we'll just give the bed a quick clean down. Well, that really brings up a nice shine. Got an imperial micrometer as you do. So let's have a look. So we're at 10, and so we don't actually care what the number, what the actual thickness is, we're just doing a relative measurement. And comparing that to the most worn area, sort of a few inches in front of the chuck. So here we've got about eight and a half. So it looks like about one and a half thou of wear vertically. If you calculate the cosine, you'll find that one and a half thou drop in the bed works out to about nothing in diameter. If you look here at the guiding ways, there's almost no nicks. There's a few very, very minor tactile nicks across the top of it. It's an induction hardened way. It appears to be very little wear on it. There's no grooving, nothing can be felt. Very nice. 
Oh, yeah, don't you just love the fonts from the early 80s? It's just like the Space Invaders era. So it does look like the wiring's been redone. Maybe it was a switch over to single phase. But then again, it does look like it was an original single phase machine. This machine's great because it's got a really wide speed range. From the lowest, which is only 30 RPM, through at a faster speed of 1680. And this model has got a few extra change wheels, so you've got a very wide range of feeds and speeds available to you. But you can get most of your normal feeds and speeds through the Norton gearbox. The good thing about this model is you've got automatic feed in both directions. So with this plunger here, you select between no feeds, feeding along the bed in the Z-axis, or feeding across the bed in the X-axis. So if we have a look here, we've got... If we push this knob here in and lift up, it gives us our transverse feed along the bed. Or, with this lever, our threading. Then if we pull that to neutral, we've got no feeds. And if we pull it out, there we go. And if we pull it out, now we've got the transverse feed in the x-axis. Yeah, yeah. To offset the top slide, we go in here with an Allen key, loosen off that screw, and there's a second one under this side. So once they're both loosened off, you've got a free, mo free movement of the top slide. Probably needs a bit of a clean under there. Oh, oh, lucky we took that off. Obviously, coolant's been used, gone underneath, and caused a bit of corrosion. But before we get too deeply into the cleanup of this lathe, Anton, what was the bycatch you got along with this machine? So we're starting off all the original booklets and stuff, that's always good to have. Notes, training lathe notes, parts illustration, machine notes. Does one of them have the, uh, have the wiring diagram in it? Have you checked? Most important thing buying a machine, get the wiring diagrams. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, we go, wiring diagram, awesome. Hey, what else we got there? Well, that has nothing to do with the lathe at all, does it? It's funny with some of the things you get with as bycatch. Huh? Number three, more center. Oh yeah, look at that, it looks like brand new, eh? Nice, very nice. Oil can, Oil can. always can useful. Do you know what he's been oiling it with? No idea. So that's an internal uh, grooving tool, very nice. Carbide insets. That looks like either a drive dog or something like that. It's, it's obviously going on the spindle. Yeah. But it's. Uh, I'm guessing it's just. He's, it's a uh, shop made, maybe. Yeah, it looks like. Sh it. Sort of, sort of a face plate or, yeah, dog driving plate or something. Yeah, carbide insert boring bar, like zero nine size TCMT inserts. So this is the, the standard Pratt Bernard three jaw five inch uh, chuck that would have been delivered with the lathe new. Beautiful. With the outside jaws. The original box. Oh cool. This is the same four jaw that I got for the Shoblin. And a nice set of lathe dogs and tool holders. You can never have too many of them. All the gear, back gear, uh... I'm guessing you can probably do all your standard stuff with the main gearbox, yeah. but you need those to do all the weird stuff. Well, there's something like 49 metric pitches on there, standard. But wait, there's more. Call now. Free steak knives. What? Okay, what have we got there? That's also a boring bar of some description. So that takes uh, high-speed steel. Boring bar double-ended. Right, yeah, so you've got one goes square across and one goes out at an angle. Complete with Allen keys. Well, very original gear. Okay, so, so box number two. Piece of steel. Mystery steels are my favourite steel for making stuff out of. Another piece of aluminium. Mm -hmm. By the way, when I found it, your dad's, he said he's got like about a zillion slugs of steel and he wants to give them all to you. Yeah. All right. What a lovely little uh, allied insert tool set. An indicator stand. That looks shop made, huh? It's got a brand on it. It's, it's shop made. Yeah, it looks like cool. a nice apprentice project, huh? 
faceplate. Man, that's a huge faceplate for a smallish lathe. I don't have a faceplate for the Shoblin yet. That's uh. So you got your eye on this one. It's in the right colour, isn't it? I wouldn't steal your faceplate. I'm going to steal your three-jaw chuck. Oh, it's actually got the keys to the lathe. Yep. All oh, right, because it's got a cabinet below it. Exactly. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's going to be nice for putting all your chucks and stuff in. So oh, what's next? All right, so just used a tie iron. That's handy. Now we got the coolant uh, thing. Oh, the coolant nozzle. Yep, yep. Damn useful. That's this cool. is the plate that goes on the back of the spindle there. The two spanners for the quick change tool post holder bits. Oh, there's a chuck key. Chuck Cute key. little one. Craftsman USA. Oh, that's good. Come in handy. Nothing to do with the lathe. This is what I mean by, by bycatch, huh? Oh, a nice little braised carbide boring tool. Dead center. Nice bit of carbide tooling there. Bit of high-speed steel. It also looks like he's looked after his tools because most of these tools look like they're not chipped or anything, huh? Nice sliding die holder. Goes on there. I made one for my mini lathe, but I, I made the I made the sticking out shaft too short, so it's bloody useless. I need to make another one. Okay, so we've got a... Oh, that, that's a tool height setter. Okay. To, to adjust your tool height. Excellent. Okay. Very nice little shop-made tool, that. Here's a circle turning attachment. Yeah, that's made. that's nice, eh? Hey? That's damn handy. My ball ball turning attachment oh, cool Pre you appreciate it. he's really looked after his gear eh? look at it there's almost yeah, no rust or anything absolutely it's certainly nice to take a tool that's been looked after and no because you're going to look after it in the future oh so that's the adapter sleeve they not quite often have like morse four and a half oh yeah down to that'll be morse three okay maybe morse five to three but it's the, they quite often have that weird four and a half size so there's the traveling steady looks like the original one yeah it looks looks barely used Yeah, that's the travelling steady because that'll bolt onto the front or the back of the cross lathe for turning, you know, for stopping uh, long skinny bits from bending out of the way. It's interesting all the stuff's that green colour. Oh yeah, yeah, it's all RAL 6011. So you, what you want to say is you want to donate it all to the Shoblin, right? So if you were able to get a really nice lathe like this, what would you do with it? Just to clean up and use or would you be into more stripped down, repaint? Personally, I quite like the patina of a machine just like this. I'd only repaint a machine like this if I went through and did a complete uh, ge geometrical overhaul, including, you know, getting the waves reground and scraping in everything. Other than that, I'd just leave the, leave the paint as it is because I think it looks cool. Have any of you used one of these Boxford 1030s before? The block here mounting this feed engagement lever was really loose but all four were kind of equally loose and it also appears to have a whole bunch of shims stuck behind it so it seems a bit weird now when i turn the lathe on and engage the feed i'm assuming this knob needs to go all the way up like horizontal but only comes up this far and goes from no engagement to engagement but it just seems just seems weird. So if any of you have this kind of lathe, can you just let us know, is there some sort of special setup, like tension that needs to be done here on this kickout mechanism? Okay, so it's one thing to clean a lathe, but you know, the one thing that's really missing here is, where's the data plate? There's gotta be a data plate and it's gotta need cleaning. So I've got a, a, a casting mark on the bed down here, just behind the motor. There's a serial number stamped into the bed up here, 248. The electric motor's got a data plate, which is unfortunately quite clean. But otherwise, I don't see one. That's a shame. So what do you think about the Made in Great Britain sticker? I like it. Yeah, it's kind of a warning label, right? Sure, yeah, put a drip tray under this machine. Now I guess the only other thing that would really add to this lathe would be putting a DRO on it. It looks almost like the apron's designed with this cutout here to allow you to mount a DRO quite easily because it's got the same cutout on the back. That's really cool. It also appears to have holes here in the cross lathe that you could probably pick up for a DRO. Looks like the back of the bed's already set up with two pairs of holes. One there and one down here, so that's brilliant. Now, would you guys also add a DRO to the top slide 
and to the tailstock. I would tend not to, but what's your opinion? Well, there we have it. Very, very nice lathe in excellent condition. It's cleaned up extremely well, and I can see it becoming the pride of a growing workshop. Thanks for watching to the end. My next Patreon live stream is going to be on the 19th of March. Hope to see you there.